I'm Dan. Um, I'm going to talk about how we use Chef currently. Um, how we use Chef has kind of evolved over the last couple of years. Um, I really kind of like where we're at right now, and I'm going to kind of run through that with you guys. Um, so Chef uh, for server provisioning can be pretty hard to wrap your head around. Um, automations sometimes are scary because they can go horribly wrong. Um, but without Chef, your server infrastructure is basically set it up and don't touch it. Um, and just stay away and hope that things don't break. Um, but Chef, it has a learning curve and you might struggle with it. Um, and I've given a lot of talks about how, you know, what Chef is and how it works, but it's really hard to cover thoroughly um, and, and really give it in a way that you can wrap your head around and go and take it and, and use it. So we're going to start with the premise that the good news is that Chef works the way it's supposed to. Use it as a tool. Don't necessarily worry about all the ins and outs, at least as you're getting started. So let's get practical and talk about how we use Chef today at SmartLogic. So let's consider this app Woof uh, from the office. Uh, so let's say that Woof, uh, if you send a Woof, the message goes to the recipient's home phone, cell phone, email, Facebook, Twitter, fax, and the home screen all at the same time. Uh, it's the most pervasive way of sending a message. Um, so if we have this app Woof, um, let's think about maybe what it has. It has a Rails app, maybe that you know, it's a unicorn server, uh, Nginx. Uh, we're going to have tokens for S3, Twitter, Facebook, Twilio for sending our SMSs and faxes and things like that. Uh, Redis and Sidekick for handling uh, various aspects in the background and uh, relational database. So how do we use the Chef tool to minimize the differences between environments? Uh, it's really important that your server cluster is kind of all about coordination of the various components that are happening. Um, so let's think about our infrastructure. We're probably going to have a staging server that's just a single VM with all the components on it. Maybe our beta environment is a little bit more robust, a little closer to what production looks like, uh, trying to still save costs but also be realistic. So we've got a web and worker VM and then a database VM. But then in production, you know, we're hoping that people are going to be woofing like crazy. <laughs> Sounds weird. Um, so we're going to say that there's a, a web, a worker, and your database VMs. Um, so Chef set up, Burke's file. The contents of this aren't particularly important. The key part is at the bottom, which is here. Um, so we started to take this approach of one Chef cookbook to rule them all. Um, so you create your own cookbook that is specific to your application, and you're going to put all the logic that you really need in there and let all the other recipes that you depend on work the way they're supposed to. Um, so these are the recipes that we're going to be really focusing on for, for the Woof deployment. Um, some sort of basic setup, configuring your database, configuring Redis, configuring your web front end like Nginx, configuring the app itself, and configuring your background worker server. So we can use these recipes in various combinations in each environment for each node in our server cluster uh, to, to build out what we need. So the recipe for your app can be very simple. And so let's look at what these recipes look like. So Wolf set up. We're just going to do the things that we need to happen on every single server to just have like a common baseline of what we're expecting. So one thing that all our servers should know is kind of what their host name is within the environment and what all the other nodes are. So we're going to use the host name recipe here and create an entry for ourselves with the fully qualified domain name that we're going to assign ourselves. And then we're going to run through the list of hosts that we know about within the infrastructure and make sure that we have an entry in our host file for everything else. That way our web server can refer to the DB server just by the host name DB. Um, what else do we need to set up? We need to make sure we have build essential for the ability to build uh, things with make and uh, compilers. We want to have OpenSSL configured. We want to have OpenSSH configured. We want pseudo access. Uh, we're going to have our admin accounts. We're going to make sure that SmartLogic's GitHub keys are all installed so that everyone can SSH into the server. And uh, we're going to want a firewall on there. Now what about our database recipe? We're going to set up and configure a database server that's hopefully better at holding data than this recycling truck is at holding paper. Um, so we're going to make sure, kind of a first baseline, whenever we use the database recipe, we're going to make sure that the setup recipe has already run. And then we're going to use the Postgres recipes that we get from Chef and just in set up the server, contribution pack, uh, contributor packages, uh, make sure that 
the Chef Ruby binary has access to Postgres so that it can do various things. And we're going to tune the Postgres database as well using uh, that cookbook. Um, then we're going to make sure that our user uh, exists and our schema is set up. So here at the top, this is just connection info uh, to connect to Postgres and then um, creates the uh, database user that we need using that connection info, sets our password, and this action is just saying I'm going to create that user. And then down here, we're actually instantiating a, the database itself. So we're saying we're going to have a UTF-8 database with the owner of the user we created before, the database name, and we're going to make sure that's created. Um, and these create actions will just create if it doesn't exist, otherwise uh, they'll do nothing. The Redis cookbook sets up our Redis server. Um, so again, we're going to make sure that our setup has run, and then we're going to install Redis, enable it, and we're going to put Monit on there to make sure our Redis stays running. Our web component is going to set up uh, our Nginx web server. So again, make sure our common setup has run, and then we're going to uh, make sure we grab Nginx from the official repositories so that we can get the latest version, uh, install Nginx itself, and then also throw Monit on there so that we can monitor the Nginx process and make sure it's working as we expect. On our application node, uh, we're going to set up the application core. So we're going to make sure our setup is run. We're going to say, well, our app needs to be able to talk to Postgres and it needs to be able to talk to Redis. So let's put those two client pieces on there. Notice we don't run Postgres server and we don't run Redis IO enable. So we're not going to actually start the Redis process, but we're going to make sure the Redis binary is on there in case we ever need to you know, check the connection or anything like that. And then we're going to leave modded on there so that we can make sure our application is running as expected. So then the next thing we're going to do in the application is we're going to introduce these two new recipes called Ruby and App Environment, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then other application dependencies that we may need. So XML for libxml and uh, to compile uh, something like Nokogiri. Uh, image magic, if we're going to be processing images, maybe our woofs contain uh, some photos. And then Node.js is good there um, you know, for making sure exec.js has a, a, um, a JavaScript runtime to do our asset precompiling. Uh, another thing that's good to do in this recipe is to rotate logs. Um, this is not particularly interesting. We're just making sure log rotates installed, templating out a log rotate.d file. Um, and then we're just saying, well, you know, in, we're going to look inside shared log for the environment that we're deployed to for that log file. We're going to rotate that. And then we, when we do, we want to touch this PID file so that Unicorn knows to reopen the log files. So I introduced two new recipes in that, in that last one. So we're going to take a look at those now. Uh, so I introduced uh, Woof Ruby, um, which is going to set up our Ruby and install Bundler. So we're just going to pull in the RBM cookbook and Ruby build. We're going to use that cookbook to uh, install the Ruby version we're expecting and make sure that that Ruby version has Bundler installed because if that's all we really need to bootstrap ourselves onto the server. The app environment cookbook, um, this is just a bunch of folder structure. It's basically laying the groundwork for Capistrano, um, but it's the only reason it's actually making the whole structure and not letting Capistrano do it is because on the next slide, we're going to template out our database.yaml file and our .env uh, file to be able to load up all our configuration. So that's what these two blocks are doing. The Woof Worker, uh, Woof worker node uh, needs some stuff to be able to, to set up for background workers. Um, so again, make sure setup is run. Uh, the worker probably needs to talk to the database. Uh, might, need, uh, might, want, might be convenient to have the Redis binary, client binary on there, so we put that on there. And then mod it to make sure a sidekick or whatever background processor we're using stays running. Uh, the Ruby and app environment uh, folder structure and, and Ruby binary make a repeat appearance here, as well as dependencies that we may have specifically for the worker node. Um, so then your, the cookbook you've created, you should give it some sensible default attributes. Um, so the, kind of just running through these really quick, they're probably hard to read, but um, the Capistrano base, just home deploy apps, deploy to app slash woof, Maybe, you know, assume the default environment that we're deploying out is production. The database will be called woof. Uh, the adapter for the database.yaml file will be Postgres. Um, 
by default, we'll just connect as the Postgres user using the root password for Postgres. Um, we'll assume it's on localhost, 25 data connection on the database pool, Ruby version of 213, and um, the, app, the environment settings, that's just a hash that we're going to use to template out that .env, you know, export a bunch of variables for our tokens, which we're about to get into. So just to review our cookbook architecture, um, the ones across the top here are the ones I mentioned kind of specifically early on plus setup. So you notice that they all call setup, and then we also had worker and app call out app environment and Ruby. And the thing that Chef does is whatever combination of these top ones we use, it will ensure that the bottom ones only get run once, even if they're called multiple times. So now we're going to configure our nodes. Uh, we're going to remove a bunch of stuff we don't need because Bruce Willis is very upset about what NASA did to his design. So, <laughs> sorry, this is funny. Um, the wolf config key within the node description and the run list kind of varies significantly from node to node. Um, most specifically, the firewall and Postgres keys vary and then the run list. So we're going to focus just on those. Your node configuration will probably have a bunch of other kind of boilerplate stuff that really won't change um, from file to file. So we're just going to kind of ignore that right now. So let's talk about firewall rules. So our network ar architecture that we kind of laid out was a staging uh, beta with a web app worker and uh, Redis database, and then production uh, web and app, a worker, and database slash Redis. So these are the ports that we need to worry about and the connections. Um, so staging everything self-contained, just port out 80 to the, the rest of the world. Uh, the web and worker want to expose 80, and the database and Redis want to expose their Redis and database ports, but only to the worker. Um, and then kind of the same deal over here, your web server is going to spit out port 80. Worker uh, is not going to have to spit out anything. And then the database and Redis connections need to both be exposed to these two servers. So we're going to run through how to do that. So this is a snippet of your J JSON file that can, uh, configures Chef to, to actually make changes to the servers. So we're specifying firewall rules here. So the staging server, like we said, is just going to expose port 80 to everybody. Um, you'll notice that we don't include port 22 because the cookbook always makes sure that 22 stays open for SSH, no matter what we define. Um, the beta uh, app and worker also exposes 80, and the database server exposes uh, 5432 and 6379 for Postgres and Redis, and they're exposing it specifically, allowing connections from the source 10.0.0.2, which was the IP of our worker. Our production server will expose port 80 to the world. Uh, our worker doesn't have to expose anything. And our production Redis and database server will expose uh, Postgres on 5.4.3.2 to both .5 and .6, and Redis on 6.3.7.9 to both .5 and, dot, uh, .5 and .6. So now we're going to talk about how Postgres gets configured for each one. Um, so on staging, Postgres is going to be running there because it's everything on one machine. Um, just some interesting highlights here. Uh, enable the other repositories for Postgres. Uh, grab a very specific version. And then the config PG tune, uh, that was that last recipe that we ran uh, under Postgres to actually tune your configuration. So this will set up basically the right memory allotments and simultaneous connection allotments based on various settings. Um, desktop is kind of a very all-around mixed, where you're assuming other things are running on the machine. So since staging is running the web server as well, we'll run it in desktop mode. Um, so for uh, the Redis server, all of that's pretty much the same um, on beta, except that we're going to, now on the listen addresses, we're going to add 10.0.0.2, uh, which uh, I didn't update, that should be .3. Um, and then for the Postgres HBA config, so this is Postgres's ability to say, I'm going to allow connections from where, kind of on top of the firewall rules. Uh, we're making sure that the woof user is allowed to access from 10.0.0.2, which is the web server. Um, and then the PG tune, since we're getting more isolated and you know, there's really not much else running on this server, we'll run it in uh, web application mode. Your other options are like data warehouse mode, transactional mode, 
um, various things depending on the types of inserts and things that you're going to do. Um, and then allow more connections. And then on production, the only other thing that's different is we now have two servers that are going to connect uh, to the database because we have both the worker who's going to connect and the web front end that's going to connect. So we have two lines, one for allowing dot five to access and one for allowing dot six to access. Okay, so now we're actually going to look at application specific settings. Um, these are pretty straightforward. Um, they don't vary a ton between each server, but this is like saying, so woof yourself, how are you going to be uh, configured? So you're going to come through here and say, okay, on this server, the Rails environment is staging. The database is going to be woof underscore staging. This key gets read out by that Postgres, uh, the database cookbook that we wrote, where it says this is the name of the database I'm going to connect, going to create. So it'll be woof underscore staging instead of the default where we just called it woof. Uh, and then the environment settings, this just all gets turned into a .env export these environment flags type stuff. The beta app worker um, is going to be, we're going to have a Rails environment we're going to call beta. Um, it's going to have wolf underscore beta as its database. And then this is where we start to specify the hosts. So this way the beta web server can refer to uh, the database server just by DB1 because it'll be in its host file. And then its settings. And then production, again, very similar. Production environment, production database. Uh, two other hosts to worry about, so the DB1 and worker1. And then the worker, it's basically the same thing, except it's concerned about, well, that should be web1. And, okay. Um, so now we're going to look at the application run lists. So what recipes are we actually going to run on each node? Um, and so this is kind of the breakdown here. Um, basically, we're running everything on staging. On beta, we're just running web, app, and worker. On the database and Redis server for beta, we're just running DB and Redis. And then in production, we're going to run web and app. We're going to run worker, and we're going to run database and Redis on the three servers. And then you notice that new relic I put in the run list on each one because we want it there. Um, it's specifically written to do the new relic server monitoring. Um, but I don't really consider it part of the application. It's part of the server infrastructure. So I like to add it to the run list kind of independently. Because um, I don't think that our app should mandate that the server it's being run on has the new relic server monitoring, but I want Chef to put it there. Um, so here's how you write the run list for each one. Uh, pretty straightforward. And again, and again, and one more. So here's our full system architecture. This shows the servers, the run list, and then also what the firewall ports that we were exposing. So, are you confused? Are you amazed? Amazed. Okay. Well, don't worry. It's a process of trial and error. But you've got this. You can look really awesome by using Chef. Any questions? All right. So uh, how do you, how is it a, a process of trial and error? Like in what way do you try things out and like make sure that your config is correct? Yeah, so the, the, neat, the neat thing about Chef is it's like, you're supposed to write your recipes in a way where kind of no matter what the state of the server is, it, you get it into a known state when it's done running. And because it's item potent, you should never be kind of afraid to just kind of keep rerunning it until you get it there. That fear gets a lot stronger once your application is actually running on it. But as you're getting started off, you know, starting off, it's kind of like, okay, run it, like see what the error you get back is. Um, with Chef 11, the error messages got a lot better. Um, there'll still be kind of weird things that you may not understand, and it's just a process of, of getting used to it to understand what it's trying to indicate to you. So, for example, if you are figuring out what your uh, cookbooks should look like, and you forget to require a dependency that your app Mm -hmm. uh, it'll give you that when you try to build it or cook it or whatever the... Yeah, um, so Chef, Chef 11 got really good about making sure your cookbooks specify dependencies on other cookbooks. You used to be able to just kind of say, include this recipe, and if it was available, you'd include it, otherwise you'd get an error. Chef now, when it compiles your cookbooks, it's really just cross-referencing 
uh, to make sure your dependencies match. And if you said, if, if I tried to do like include recipe Postgres and I didn't say I depended on it, I would get an error that's actually somewhat sensical as far as like, you know, I couldn't find Postgres in, in the scope of this cookbook. And it's because I said I didn't, I didn't say I depended on it. Which, it's a little confusing the first time because you're like, well, it's in my, my Burks file. Like, I, I'm, I'm declaring that I, my uh, kitchen as a whole depends on it. But because my cookbook doesn't say it's going to use it, it actually creates an error now. Um, so that's kind of like one thing. Um, as far as if you leave out a dependency your application has, you won't know until you actually try to put your application on there. The one I always forget is Node.js. Um, for whatever reason, the projects I've worked on haven't been using the Ruby, the Ruby racer or libv8, so it's not there. So then I go and deploy it out, and it goes to asset precompile, and execjs says uh, there's no, there's nothing for me to use. Um, and then so rather than like restructure my application, like add the Ruby racer, do add all that on that side, it's usually I usually just say okay, package no, you know, recipe node.js. Now I know there's a, a JavaScript runtime on there, and you know that way my application can stay the same. Um, it doesn't have to change its configuration for Borg. No one has to change their configuration on their desktop. Um, yeah. Sam? Do we still use a mix of Chef with Capistrano? Like when, uh, to have like over time the boundaries between like over responsibility shift? At all? Yeah, so my, I guess my first talk was two years ago and I, I talked about both. Right. Um, and we still use both with pretty much the same line. Um, everything here was really just about laying the groundwork for the application itself. And we still do the application deployment with Capistrano. And I was going to talk about both, but it got really long. So I said, I'm going to focus on Chef. Right, but since then, like the, the... The boundary hasn't really changed. Um, like if you look at what we did, we pretty much, we set up packages, folder structure, um, environment variables, that kind of stuff. But we didn't do anything along the lines of like, we installed Monit, but we didn't tell Monit what to look for, what to monitor, how to start processes. Because that's application specific. So to my, to, you know, from my standpoint, we didn't set up Nginx configuration. You know, what is, what's the host name? What's, you know, uh, what ports are we listening to? Are we rewriting certain URLs? That's very specific to the application. So I put that in the Capistrano configuration and let it install that way. 